everyone, Aimer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. This time I'm reviewing Season 6, Episode 8, which is called Underwater. So this one starts off with a guy on a boat who we learn is named Frederick Hoffman, looking at a briefcase full of diamonds, handcuffed to a guy who's either dead or unconscious. Hoffman rigs up a bomb on the boat, sends a guy's body off the boat, following him in scuba gear, and changing, chaining him to a heavy boulder while the boat explodes above. Another man, who we learn is George Berlinger, hears the news on the radio about the explosion. As his men, Hawks and Simmons, bring Berlinger into his office, uh, sorry, bring Hoffman into his office, after finding him at a motel, apparently preparing to escape the country. Berlinger's story is that he was thrown overboard in the explosion and is lucky to be alive. But Hoffman is quite skeptical of the story, and demands to know where the diamonds are. Jim gets his instructions from a mailbox. The mission? In 48 hours, Berlinger has a deal set for the diamonds, which are worth $75 million. The IMF must get the diamonds, the cash, and put Berlinger out of business. We have an apartment scene where we see some interesting gadgetry and a diamond that is a duplicate of one of the stolen ones. We cut to some scenes of Berlinger's men searching for the diamonds, and they come across another diver, forcing him at gunpoint to surface, at knife point, I should say. It turns out to be Jim, who claims to just be enjoying a dive, but Hawks tells him get out of the area and stay out. Willie comes into Berlinger's building to deliver a compressor to repair an air conditioner, which goes into storage for the weekend. The guard wants to confirm it is what it is, so Willie shows it to him from the top. Unless this is your first time watching the show, you know exactly what, or rather who, is inside the large box. Simmons and Berlinger give Hoffman large druses of truth serum to try and get him to talk, but it doesn't work. Hawks ends his day at a restaurant with Casey following him in, claiming to have lost a ring. And she plants the diamond ring in a booth, finding it, and expert Hawks knows, notices it quite clearly, following Casey to her building, climbing up to her balcony, chloroforming her, and then a few moments later we see him driving off, with Jim appearing from behind a wall and heading up to make sure that Casey is okay. She's unharmed, but Hawks of course took the ring, and it matches one from his list. Barney gets out of the big box and starts making, uh, starts cutting through some walls to get to the elevator shaft, and works his way up having to do his usual thing of carefully avoiding it go up and down, and getting to the roof above the room where Hoffman is being held. He sprays some anesthetic gas to knock Simmons out, with Hoffman still in a daze, watching as Barney makes a Simmons mask and mimics his voice perfectly somehow, getting a guard to help him get Hoffman down to the garage, just as Hawks finds Simmons knocked out and alerts the garage sentry, who holds Barney as Simmons at gunpoint, but Barney is adeptly able to deck the guard next to him and hop over to his waiting convertible, tossing Hoffman into it and flooring the car out of the garage. Berlinger comes to visit Casey, asking about where she got the diamond and asking to buy more. Casey, as Mary Haywood, says her boyfriend Jim the scuba diver, who's named Bob Warner, might be interested in talking to him, and gives him Jim's address in exchange for having the ring returned. Berlinger heads there and tells Jim that he knows that Jim has found the diamonds, but needs Berlinger to get full value for them. He can't sell them on his own. Berlinger offers to cut Jim in for $5 million to go retrieve them, and he agrees. Barney tells Hoffman he's an insurance investigator named Ben Williams, hoping to recover the diamonds so he can retire on his commission for them, and is willing to split that commission with Hoffman. Hoffman is not interested, but Barney tells him that, look, the diamonds have been found. Some are already on the market, so Hoffman's obvious plan to keep the diamonds for himself isn't going to work. Hoffman wants to talk to Mary Haywood to confirm the story. They head to her place where Berlinger notices a pistol pointed at them from the opposite window. And it's Willie, and Casey appears to get shot thanks to a trick IMF window. Hoffman is quite convinced that the diamonds have been found and says he'll get them, but he needs Barney's help to do it. So we see Jim and Hoffman getting ready to dive, uh, but Willie is also prepared, and the IMF members have ear signals to keep them in contact. Berlinger predictably tells Hawks that if, when Jim comes up with the diamonds, they can easily dispose of him. Barney fires a marker into the ocean and watches the diver's positions on a monitoring screen. Gets Willie into position to follow Hoffman and tells Jim where to dive down. 
Hoffman finds a guy with a briefcase still attached to him and cuts the chain as Willie watches from behind and Jim comes down from above. Barney activates a device in Hoffman's mask, which knocks him out briefly, allowing Jim and Willie to move in. Jim surfaces with the briefcase, but it contains only a single diamond. Jim says he's no fool. He gave the rest of the diamonds to a friend who will deliver them when Jim gets his $5 million. Berlinger, left with no choice, tells Hawks to get his contact to go to Jim's place as Willie as Casey watch Hoffman and the dead courier guy taken away by authorities. At Jim's place, a man named Connors arrives with his bodyguard, and Berlinger explains the unusual circumstances around what's happening. Jim agrees to produce the diamonds as long as he sees that the money is present, and Connors obliges. Jim makes a call, and cops burst in through every door. Jim slips out quietly and joins the IMF in their car. Mission accomplished. I'm going to give this episode a grade of D+. It has a couple of neat spots to, to start with the good. Those mostly center around the work that Barney does in Berlinger's office building. The you know We've seen him many times, you know, cut into the elevator shaft, go up the elevator shaft, avoid the elevator. That could all be, you know, recycled footage for all we know. It prob much of it probably is. Uh, but when he comes in and he's able to come down from the ceiling, it's kind of neat that, you know, the way that scene is staged, we have uh, Simmons, you know, administering, you know, drugs to Hoffman. And Hoffman's kind of looking up and he's kind of in a daze and he sees Barney up there. But, you know, he, he's kind of out of it. And he's like, whoa, man, what's that guy doing up there? And <laughs> That, that that was kind of funny to me. Uh, and, and the way Barney is able to, you know, uh, anesthetize Simmons, come down from the ceiling, uh, you know, up, somehow or other he has enough time. Uh, I don't know why it took as much time as it seemed to, to make uh, the mask of Simmons and, you know, get dressed, whatever, and escape down in the parking lot. And then Barney does manage to actually get out of the parking lot, even though the guard downstairs has been warned that it's not really Simmons. So that part of the episode was really, really neat. That was the high point. The rest of it is uh, is not so great, and I'll, I'll come to that when we move on from the good. Regarding the good, the guest cast is okay. I wouldn't say they're great. Fritz Weaver, who plays Berlinger, we've talked about it before. Uh, other than his first foray in, in mission in Operation Rogosh, way back at the beginning, he hasn't really got good scripts, and this is no exception. This is kind of sad. It's a waste of Fritz Weaver. He's capable of doing so much more. He maximizes his minutes. I think he gives a really good performance, but there, there's really not much for him to do here. The other guests are just okay, and same deal. I'm sure they're, they're, they're all very capable actors. The plot just really doesn't give them a whole lot to do. Uh, the, the, and the IMF basically, unfortunately, kind of schmuckifies the bad guys, um, not quite as badly as we had a couple of episodes uh, ago in The Miracle, but it's the same idea, um, and I'll just have more to say about that. Jeremy Slate as Frederick Hoffman isn't bad either, but again, the, what the plot basically expects of him is not that much. He doesn't have a lot to do other than kind of act catatonic, which I think he does pretty admirably, but it, it, there's really not a whole lot for him to do at that point due to the effect of the drugs that he's being administered. And then he spends the rest of the, the, rest of the episode underwater. Uh, so, you know, again, there's not a whole heck of a lot there. Moving on to stuff that, that, that was not so good. Uh, I've already mentioned kind of some of it. Uh, this one is a really, really slow mover. Uh, the underwater scenes are not as great visually as they could be. I read in the Mission Impossible dossier that these scenes weren't actually shot underwater. They were basically shot in a big, uh, you know, water tank. Um, to kind of get the effect. And while it's not obvious, you know, I wouldn't have known that unless I had read it in the book. Uh, I, again, I, it, it, there's just this feeling that, that, you know, it's like, okay, it's, 
they're underwater, you know. Uh, it, it, it that that part of it, I seem to remember taking a lot of TV time. It doesn't take as much time as I remember, but still, the plot is a really slow mover, in my opinion. Another big problem: the bad guys, as I've already kind of mentioned, they get schmuckified throughout the uh, the story, throughout the episode. They don't really show a lot of formidability. The IMF doesn't seem to have a very difficult time accomplishing this mission. The only problem point for the IMF is in the parking garage with Barney after, you know, he's been found out that, you know, he, that Sim, he's not really, you know, Simmons. After that, it's completely smooth sailing. And it, it occurs to me that the IMF would still have found a way to finish the mission. They would have got Hoffman out some other way from that building if they had to. It just, there, there's, there's not a high degree of difficulty here. Also something that, that was not good, and I think that also really hurt this episode. There is a, it, this is one of those episodes where there's a bit of a lack of a clear quote unquote bad guy. And I think that this is going to become a little bit more of a problem uh, in episodes as we go on. If you remember the season two episode called Trek, I mentioned in that one that that was kind of problematic because we had two bad guys. We had one guy who was clearly a bad guy and we had one guy who was a thief. Uh, you know, obviously not a good guy, but he wasn't kind of as bad as the other guy. And I mentioned then, and I stand by it, there have been, there's been the odd episode where this has also been the case, where the, that, that lack of having somebody to identify and kind of root against is a problem in the episode. Uh, you know, we've got Hoffman, who's not a good guy, but he certainly doesn't seem as much a bad guy, quote unquote, as Burlinger. Uh, it, 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 it's a little dicey, and I think that that, do, that doesn't really help the episode, and that contributes to the relatively low grade. Moving on to something that I wanted to discuss. I realized that in my last uh, review for Encounter, I forgot to mention a one reason why I couldn't really give it, you know, the, the, the best grade, like, you know, an S or an A+. Plus. I think I did give it an A+. Plus. But one of the things that, was, was, that went against it was the abrupt ending. If you recall in that episode, you know, the IMF go through the plot. Um, Martin Stoner ends up going to the bank. I, I forget. His, his boss, Frank, I forget his last name. And, and his guy, Decker came up behind him, and then the IMF are just two steps behind those guys. And in the end, you know, once the evidence kind of surfaces, Jim just kind of taps the guy on the shoulder and says, I'll take that. And it wasn't quite as bad as it, it does get in some future episodes. But it, it's just that feeling of, you know, all that, you know, hey, we, we got you guys. I'll take that. All that stuff we did in the last 40 minutes was just basically filler, right? It was kind of almost as, as though this was an excuse plot. Uh, in, in, in Encounter, I think I, I kind of lost sight of that because everything was kind of overshow, overshadowed by the excellence of all of the stuff surrounding Elizabeth Ashley as the lowest donor. But again, it kind of happens here where, you know, Jim gets the guys in a room, he's got the money, he's got the evidence, and then he just makes a call and it's like, okay, cops, come on in. And that's what happens. I thought about this. And I said to myself, is, is it just me or, you know, why am I bothered by these kind of abrupt endings? Why does it seem like it's, ha it, it's happening more often and it, 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 it didn't happen so much before? And, and, and I did sit and I really thought about this. There, there, there are a lot of reasons and it has to do with the way the whole, the, the, the whole series has kind of changed at this point. Especially during, it started in season five, but it's really turned a little bit further in season six. In early seasons, we didn't have plots where at the end, the IMF do the whole, we got you thing at the end. Most of the time, they had already left by the time the bad guys realized that they had been had. Or in many, in many cases, you know, the, the IMF to hear a gunshot sound, you know, off screen or something like that. that. That was just the nature of the beast. And again, a lot of that had to do with the fact that many of the uh, episodes had to deal with stuff going on in foreign countries. 
The first time I recall something like this, where there's kind of the whole I, we got you ending, and I don't even think it was really deliberate at that point, was the season two episode, uh, the a game of chess. The marks are basically with the IMF the entire way through, and then they get caught basically with their hand in the cookie jar and kind of left there by the IMF. I looked and I didn't really find a lot of examples of this in seasons three and four. Uh, and I think that most of it is because a lot of the action is happening in those foreign countries. And in that case, the IMF simply doesn't have the option that they do now. In those episodes and previous seasons, since they are in other places, not in the United States, their main goal has to be not just to the, accomplish the mission, but they also have to have an escape plan. They also have to have a way of getting away safely out of the country or away from wherever the action is happening. They don't need to do that here. They're dealing more and more, for good or bad, they're dealing more and more with domestic criminals. So the focus is, okay, let's spend time. And I do notice, now that I thought about this, the authors are paying more attention to that. The focus is more on them dealing with the bad guys. Sometimes it's very entertaining and sometimes like this one, it's kind of ordinary. But they're spending more time dealing with the bad guys, just getting them to the crucial point, And then, hey, you know, officers take them away. And, you know, it is what it is. We started seeing this in season five. If you go back to the early episode in season five called Flipside, you know, the uh, the IMF, again, and that was basically a domestic plot, okay, uh, where the IMF, you know, get the evidence that they need, they get all of the bad guys in one place, and they call the cops in. They did the same thing in the episode The Hostage, although that was in a foreign country. It was more of one, you know, kind of like this, where it was there was kind of like that whole, whole we got you ending. And especially in the late season five episode, The Party, which again was also a, it involved, you know, foreign characters, but it was more of a domestic plot. It occurred in the United States. So most of the action occurred in the United States. So it was like that. We can just kind of say, we got you, and now the cops are going to take, you know, the bad guys away. The... So, so, so that, so that's kind of where that 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 is coming from, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, I was gonna call it out for being bad, but it's gonna happen more and more. And I guess this is the reason why. Uh, it, 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 it's not bad so much as it is kind of a fact of life because of the way that the plots are in season six and season seven. Uh, it, it also kind of has to do, I think, with. And again, I don't know how deliberate this is, but there is kind of this thing about where we have, you know, previously in, in, pre in previous seasons, we would mostly be talking about the antagonists as bad guys. You know, a guy who's trying to take power in a foreign country or something like that. Here, we're just talking about criminals, mostly white collar criminals, but domestic white uh, criminals nonetheless. So it, 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 it is different. There is something kind of different about the way the IMF deals with that type of antagonist versus the type of antagonist that we have seen in previous seasons. I just kind of found that interesting. And rather than calling these episodes out for being bad because of, you know, the way things have changed, I'm just going to acknowledge that things have changed and that may just be, you know, a side effect that we just have to live with. And, and I guess I can kind of forgive that as long as the missions are, you know, are entertaining. Not as much time is spent on the escape part of it. And, and I guess that's okay as long as they can put that same kind of energy into making a good plot. Unfortunately, this one falls somewhat short of the mark for a lot of the reasons that I've already mentioned. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you guys, as always, for watching. Always much appreciated. Uh, please like this review video. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And um, please leave your comments about this episode and other episodes. Thank you again, and I will see you next time.